Here's what the Historia Augusta has to say about the entrance of Elagabalus into Rome. To return to Antonius Varius, having obtained the imperial power, sent messengers to Rome, and all ranks were stirred up, and an immense longing for him was also created among the whole people through the name Antoninus, which seemed to have returned not as a title only, as it had been for Diademinus, but actually in the blood, since he had written what he was the son of Antonius Bassianus, a royal priest from Amessa. He brought with him the reputation that is usually given to the new princeps who follow usurpers. Although it does not last except with the highest virtues and many mediocre princeps have lost it. In short, when Heliogobalus' letter was read in the Senate, at once good wishes were spoken for Antoninus and curses against Macrinus and his son. And Antonius was acclaimed princeps. All were in favor and eager to believe as happens with the prayers of men who hasten to believe when they are longing for what they desire to be true. But when he first entered the city to leave out what was done in the provinces, he enshrined Heliogobalus on the Palatine Hill next to the temple of the emperors and built a temple for him, being eager to transfer to that temple both the emblem of the mother goddess and the fire of Vesta, the Palladium, the sacred shields, and all the objects sacred to the Romans, so that no god should be worshipped at Rome except Heliogobalus. Furthermore, that the religions of the Jews and the Samaritans and the rites of the Christians ought to be transferred there, so that the priesthood of Heliogobalus might include the mysteries of every cult. So if this is true, this would mean that Elagabalus himself, part of the reason why Christianity becomes an accepted religion in Rome. This leads up to Philip the Arab a few decades later being baptized and accepting Christianity. Elagabalus was born in 203, Varius Avitus Bassianus, and also given the name Marcus Aurelius Antonius Augustus when he became Caesar. There were rumors that he was the son of Caracallus, which isn't true. Elagabalus' family held hereditary rights to the priesthood of the sun god. When Elagabalus himself was the high priest at Emesa in Roman Syria as a part of the Emesene dynasty, the deity's Latin name, Elagabalus. Going back to Herodi, when she saw what Elagabalus was doing, Mesa was greatly disturbed and tried again and again to persuade the youth to wear Roman dress when he entered the city to visit the Senate, referring to his Syrian Phoenician garb. She was afraid that his appearance, obviously foreign and wholly barbaric, would offend those who saw him. They were not used to such garb and considered his ornaments suitable only for women. But Elagabalus had nothing but contempt for the old woman's warnings, nor did anyone else succeed in convincing him. He would listen only to those who were like him and flattered his faults. Since, however, he wished the Senate and the Roman people to grow accustomed to seeing him in his costume and wished to test their reaction, to this exotic site. Before he returned to Rome, he had full-length portrait painted, showing him performing his priestly duties in public. His native god also appeared in the painting. The emperor was depicted sacrificing to him under favorable auspices. Elagabalus sent this picture to Rome to be hung in the center of the Senate House, high above the statue of Nika Victory which each senator burns frankincense and pours libation of wine upon, entering the chamber. He directed all Roman officials who perform public sacrifices to call upon the new god Elagabalus before all others 
whom they invoke in their rites. By the time the emperor came to Rome, presenting the appearance described above, the Romans saw nothing unusual in it, for the painting had prepared them for what to expect. Elagabalus made the distinction of money customary at the succession of the emperor and staged lavish and extravagant spectacles of every kind. He erected a huge, magnificent temple to his god, surrounded it with numerous altars. Coming forth every morning, he sacrificed there hecatombs of bulls and a vast number of sheep. These he placed upon the altars and heaped up spices of every kind. He also set before the altars many jars of the oldest, finest wines, so that the streams of blood mingled with the streams of wine. Elagabalus danced around the altars to music, played on every kind of instrument. Women from his own country accompanied him in these dances, carrying cymbals and drums, and circled altars. The entire senate and all the knights stood watching, like spectators at the theater. People were amazed. The spices, the entrails of the sacrificial animals were not carried by serpents or men of low birth. Rather, they were borne along in gold vessels held on high by Praetorian prefects and the most important magistrates who wore long sleeve robes and a broad purple stripe in the center. Robes which hung to their feet in the Phoenician style. On their feet were linen shoes customarily worn by Eastern prophets. It was obvious that Elagabalus was praying to the highest honor to those associated with him in the performance of the sacred rites. Even though the emperor seemed to be devoting all his attention to dancing and his priestly duties, still he found the time to execute many famous and wealthy men who were charged with ridiculing and censoring his way of life. He married one of the noblest of the Roman ladies, proclaimed her Augusta, but he soon divorced her after depriving her of imperial honors, ordered her to return to private life so that he might seem to be doing something manly. He made love to one of the Vestal Virgins of Rome, priestesses who are bound by sacred vows to be chaste and remain virgin until the end of their lives. Taking the maiden away from Vesta in the Holy Virgin's quarters, he made her his wife. He sent a letter to the Senate asking to be forgiven for his impious adolescent transgression, telling them that he was afflicted in overwhelming passion for the maiden. He also informed them that the marriage of a priest and a priestess was both proper and sanctioned. But a short time later, he divorced the girl and took yet a third wife, a girl who belonged to the family of Commodus. Not content with making a mockery of human marriage, he even sought a wife for the god whose priest he was. He brought into his own bedroom the statue of Pallas, which the Romans worship hidden and unseen. Even though the statue has not been moved from the time that it was first brought from Troy, except when the temple of Vesta was destroyed by fire, Elagabalus moved it now and brought it into the palace to be married to his god, proclaiming that his god was not pleased by a goddess of war wearing full armor. He sent for the statue of Urania, which the Carthaginians and Libyans especially venerate. This statue, they say, Dido the Phoenician set up at the time when she cut the hide into strips and founded the city of ancient Carthage. The Libyans call this goddess Urania, but the Phoenicians worship her as Astarte, identifying her with the moon, claiming that he was arranging a marriage between the sun and the moon Elagabalus sent for the statue and all the gold in the temple and ordered the Carthaginians to provide, in addition, a huge sum of money for the goddess's dowry. When the statue arrived, he set it up with his god and ordered all men in Rome and throughout Italy to celebrate with lavish feasts and festivals, publicly and privately, in honor of the marriage of the deities. 
In the suburbs of Rome, the emperor built a very large and magnificent temple to which every year in midsummer he brought his god. He staged lavish shows and built racetracks and theaters, believing the chariot races shows and countless recitals would please the people who held night-long feasts and celebrations. Placed the sun god in a chariot with gold and jewels and brought him out from the city to the suburbs. A six-horse chariot bore the sun god, the horses huge and flawlessly white and expensive gold fittings and rich ornaments. No one held the reins and no one rode in the chariot. The vehicle was escorted as if the sun god himself were the charioteer. Elagabalus ran backward in front of the chariot, facing the god and holding the horse's reins. He made the whole journey in this reverse fashion, looking up into the face of his god. Since he was unable to see where he was going, his route was paved with gold dust to keep him from stumbling and falling, and bodyguards supported him on each side to protect from injury. The people ran parallel to him, carrying torches and tossing wreaths and flowers. The statues of all the gods, costly or sacred offerings in the temples, the imperial ornaments, valuable heirlooms were carried by the cavalry under Praetorian guard in honor of the sun god. After this, bringing the god out and placing him in the temple, Elagabalus performed the rites and sacrifices described above, then climbing to huge lofty towers, which he had erected, he threw down indiscriminately cups of gold and silver, clothing and cloth of every type to the mob below. He also distributed all kinds of tame animals except swine, which in accordance with Phoenician custom, he shunned. Many lost their lives in ensuing scramble, impaled on the soldier's spears, trampled to death. Thus the celebration of the emperor brought tragedy to a host of people. Elagopolis was often seen driving a chariot or dancing. He had no desire to sin in secret, but appeared in public with eyes painted and cheeks rubbed. These cosmetics mare to a face naturally handsome.